Chapter 27, Energy and Environment. Development by which societies today meet their needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Definition of Sustainability by Gro Harlem Brundtland, 1987, Report of the World Commission on Environment and Development. 27.1, Man and Nature. Energy and environmental concerns are not new. In the first edition, George Perkins Marsh, 1850, Man and Nature, pointed out how uses of the land affected microclimates and watersheds. Already, Marsh was stressing the dangers of imprudence and the necessity of caution. His concerns extended to damage to biological communities, and he mentioned the ways the Suez Canal would mix waters from alien seas. Jevons' late 1800s concern about the exhaustion of coal resources illustrated another aspect of environmental questions, as does Thomas Malthus' earlier concerns about the inevitability of overpopulation. These references provide examples of what seem to be three major views of the environmental sustainability problem. First, overpopulation, second, natural resource exhaustion, and third, damage to the environment. In the opening quote, Gro Harlem Brundtland defines sustainability. While we dislike the term sustainability because it implies a static world, we think we understand the sentiment. We take it to mean a condition where the use of resources can support a healthy ecological complex into far distant futures. In our view, that shouldn't bar shifts from one resource to another as technologies and factor prices change. Actually, such shifts can in attaining a sustainable condition. For instance, fuel shifts have decreased the carbon intensity of energy consumption, decreasing CO2 per unit of consumption, and acid precipitation. The recent increase in natural gas fuel in place of coal has helped reduce U.S. CO2 output measurably. It is widely felt that tomorrow's transportation choices must accept energy and environmental constraints, real or perceived. That there are constraints is undeniable, although it is countered by argument that poverty, nutrition, and other sweeping problems ought not to be subordinated to relatively minor and manageable energy and environmental problems. There is also the opportunity cost concern about short-sighted policies that have unintended effects and waste resources, especially by giving an illusion of progress and diverting attention away from richer directions for actions. The authors recognize that debates and actions of these types are common and regard them as overhead costs in an intellectually active society. The amount of that cost and its increase may be of issue, of course. Energy and environmental issues bear especially on transportation, although they may have been eased by recent developments. Technology and price increases are making expensive but extensive petroleum sources economically viable. The interrelated CO2 emissions and climate change issues are being viewed more broadly. The Intergovernmental Report on Climate Change says, Climate change may be due to natural internal processes or external forces or to the persistent anthropogenic changes in the composition of the atmosphere or in land use. There is no longer the single issue of carbon fuel burning. It is recognized that land uses may affect temperature records and there is room to consider forces that yielded the medieval and Roman war periods. Twenty seven point two energy. 27.2.1, running out. In 1984, the Reagan administration shredded 4.8 billion ration coupons being sorted at a warehouse in Pueblo, Colorado. These coupons had prepared just in case federal gasoline rationing would be required, and were a response to the apparent fuel shortages of the 1970s. However, since deregulation, beginning in 1980, despite the efforts of President Jimmy Carter and continuing in the early 1990s under President Ronald Reagan, Gasoline prices were falling and concerns about shortages disappeared. Fuel shortages had been known before. World War II was an example. However, during the war, gasoline was being diverted from domestic to military use and was largely unchallenged. The oil shortages of 1973 to 1974 were associated with the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, oil embargo of October 17, 1973, which was a response to the Yom Kippur War when Israel's Arab neighbors attacked. The oil embargo shocked the system. Oil is fungible, and OPEC members were not the only producers, so if OPEC stopped selling oil to certain parties, they might still sell to other countries, which could then substitute OPEC oil for their other sources, freeing those other sources to sell to the Western countries. But still, all the disruption in production cutbacks should, at a minimum, have driven prices up, thereby decreasing consumption. In a well-functioning market, the other effect of such a price rise is to encourage new producers to enter the market. Oil that was previously too expensive might now be feasible. Well-functioning markets have a way of equilibrating shocks so that supply still equals demand, even if the price changes. So why were there shortages in the United States? Why were there lines at gas stations? 
The conventional explanation is that the embargo caused the shortage, but the evidence shows that domestic oil production dropped in 1974. See figure 27.1. And oil imports increased. That is a very strange response to a price hike due to an international embargo. The better explanation for why domestic oil production dropped has to do with federal policy response to the shortage. Just after the embargo, Congress passed, and President Richard Nixon signed, the Emergency Petroleum Allocation Act, EPAA, which had been in the legislative pipeline for some time. This act instituted a two-tier price system, one tier for existing domestic oil reserves, whose prices were to be kept at pre-embargo levels, and a second tier for all other sources, whose prices were to be uncontrolled. The result was that domestic producers would sell little, old oil at below market rates, and there was a contraction in domestic production until new oil fields, which would be priced at market rates, were brought online, a process that takes several years. This law was in character with the era which had seen other wage price freezes. The Energy Policy and Conservation Act of 1975 extended the EPAA and created a fixed maximum price for new oil. The act also established the corporate average fuel economy or CAFE standards, which are generally seen as successful. The Iranian Revolution, followed by the hostage crisis of 1979, instituted a second period of shortage. Iranian oil was removed from the market, marking a 5% reduction in supplies to the United States. Again, this would be expected to increase prices, which they did, but clearly regulated prices cannot respond as quickly as market prices. Normally, individuals would respond to price hikes by reducing consumption in the manner most efficacious to them. However, to prod the process, President Jimmy Carter proposed several conservation measures. These included a prohibition on the sale of gasoline during certain weekend hours, limiting thermostats in buildings to 18 degrees C, 65 degrees Fahrenheit for heating, and 27 degrees C, 80 degrees Fahrenheit for cooling, and restricting non-essential lighting for advertising. Congress only approved the second measure. Nevertheless, because of a large change in the wholesale price of oil and caps on the retail price, shortages ensued. The results of these policies follow the law of unintended consequences. New oil production boomed, while old oil was pulled from the market, which led to a boom in the Texas economy. Houston real estate especially took off. The boom lasted a few years into the 1980s as people expected high oil prices to remain. Markets hadn't equilibrated properly in the past. Why should they now? Ultimately, it did crash, bringing their financiers, the newly deregulated but still federally insured savings and loan industry, down with it. With the deregulation in the 1980s, especially the Petroleum Price and Allocation Decontrol Act of 1981, along with more fuel-efficient autos in the fleet and changes in consumption patterns, domestic oil production increased and imports of oil dropped. OPEC responded with production cuts to keep the price of oil high, but the effectiveness of this cartel was broken when Saudi Arabia increased production in late 1985. By 1986, oil prices had dropped significantly. In the 1990s, the fuel efficiency of the U.S. fleet decreased with a large increase in the use of trucks, especially minivans and sport utility vehicles, as passenger transportation. However, oil disruptions associated with the 1990 Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq did not result in shortages, though prices did rise in both periods. 27.2.2 Is Transportation Obese? Transportation moves mass. To do so, energy is used to accelerate mass to cruise speeds, up a hill, and so on. In theory, that is no matter because potential energy is recoverable when decelerating. In practice, of course, there is always energy loss when work is done. Energy is not recovered very well when decelerating. Often it is wasted as heat when brakes are applied. For a given acceleration task, the amount of energy required depends on the mass to be accelerated. Because packages, containers, cars, and so on of some sort are used to contain things to be moved, we need to be concerned with laden, gross, and unladen, tear, weights. Today's automobile weights, for example, about 1,400 kilograms, 3,000 pounds, empty, tear weight, and moves about 1.15 persons, say 90 kilograms, or 200 pounds. A 10-wheel truck's tear weight is about 9,000 kilograms and the tear weight of a 120-ton rail car might be 25 tons. See rail truck containers have a 10 to 1 loaded empty ratio. Not bad comparatively, but containers must be carried on some vehicle. An intercity passenger rail car might weigh 80 tons. If it weren't for acceleration-deceleration energy losses, gross weight wouldn't matter, except that the system with a high ratio of gross to laden weight suggests that work is being done and material being used unnecessarily. Energy is required to overcome air resistance. See figure 27.2. Rolling resistance, mechanical resistance, which includes the resistance to movement by bearings and seals, as well as resistance at the wheel ground interface. Velocity dependent resistance results from the work being done as load shift, couplers, rub, and so on. 
Note that air resistance begins to become important at velocities between 40 and 70 km per hour and dominates at higher velocities. This figure uses the Davis equations which understate air resistance. 27.2.3 Energy use Transportation is not the only user of energy. Petroleum comprises about 39% of all energy used in the United States, and transportation only used two-thirds of the petroleum, or about one-fourth of energy consumed in the U.S. per year, as seen in figure 27.3. The reasoning that development induces lots of transportation which consumes large amounts of energy has to be tempered. Poorer countries are less efficient in their energy, or perhaps less efficient countries are poorer, as seen in figure 27.4. Transportation mainly uses petroleum energy, of course, but even if we narrow the problem to petroleum energy use, it can't be cured by transportation-focused actions alone. That's because about 33% of petroleum use is by non-transportation sectors, as seen in figure 27.5. Some say there is no urgency because a good many decades of petroleum energy are available in alternative fuels, such as liquefied natural gas, LNG, and more decades of business as usual. All we need to do is to begin to reduce emissions and be more fuel efficient. This may be true, but not knowing either the severity of emission problems, such as the CO2 situation, or future political stability in petroleum resource holding regions, we think it's past time to begin to seek new development path for transportation. Some hold the view that non-transportation energy use will be managed by transition to a nuclear, solar, or hydrogen society. It is argued that the public will discover and accept advances in nuclear technology. Things get bad enough, something will happen. Transportation may shift to electric power, either with fuel cell or batteries. Absent looking at other things, it may be a default strategy. Futurists speak of a hydrogen economy where electricity is generated by hydrogen-powered fuel cells. Almost three-quarters of transportation energy use is by auto and truck. But curing auto energy use won't achieve sustainability because 16.2 quads of energy use would remain to be treated. See figure 27.6. Light trucks have two axles and four tires. They consume about 60% of total truck energy consumption. As we know, many light trucks are used for car-like purposes, yet they are regulated like trucks and so face fewer energy efficiency regulations than autos. Increases in automobile energy use have stabilized. Intercity bus and rail have concentrated their service and this has increased their energy efficiency. There isn't much left to thin out, so the outlook is poor. The urban rail, bus, and auto modes do not differ very much in their energy intensities. The outlook for improvements is pretty good for the automobile, at least technically. The outlook is not good for the transit modes under the present policy of expanding services to thinner markets, aiming to achieve spatial coverage goals rather than ridership goals. Commercial air transportation uses about 2.5 quads per year, and the new aircraft entering the fleet will continue improvements in their fuel efficiency. Personal trucks are energy gulpers compared to the other passenger modes, see figure 27.7. We need to pay special attention to the big users, automobiles and small trucks, as shown in figure 27.6. What about the elasticity of demand as energy costs change? Unsurprisingly, higher gasoline prices result in the purchase of more fuel-efficient cars, while the amount of auto use increases with lower gasoline prices. Intercity trucks are fuel gulpers as seen in figure 27.8, but have improved by about 14% since 1970. It's said that about one-half of freight truck travel is in urban areas, and those trucks must be very energy inefficient because, in general, loads are light. What about the diversion of freight from trucks to the other freight modes, especially railroads? This has been examined quite a bit, and the opportunity for intercity freight diversion from trucks to other modes is limited because of the shipment size and service difference among the modes. However, trailer, container, or freight car, TOFC, COFC, is diverting freight from trucks partly because of fuel cost savings. The problem is that this diversion is limited to dense freight movement quarters, such as Los Angeles to Chicago, because it is in such quarters that railroads can offer good service. Twenty seven point three environment twenty seven point three point one is transportation sustainable? Uneasiness exists that the present transportation development path is not sustainable. The word is used in many contexts. We hear transportation is gulping finite resources, petroleum in particular, that cannot continue forever. Transportation-induced air and water pollution, soil degradation, and ecological insults are or will soon be causing irreversible harm. Transportation services result in the conversion of farmland to urban uses and damage to parks in degrees that cannot con continue. Even more broadly, the transportation-based society is consuming resources of all types at rates that cannot be continued. 
The September-October 1984 TR News placed sustainable transportation first in its list of issues and says that transportation policy is incompatible with a healthy world environment. Whatever their shape, these questions are important and deserve concern and action. Thoughtful debates about these issues range from analytic discussions about the truth of claims through adjustment mechanisms of an economic or technological substitution sort to calls for drastic policy constraints on consumption. While the discussion to follow will involve technological options, it will not attempt to illuminate these debates. Nor will we argue a reactive stance that something will come along when things get bad enough school of thought. Lessons from history do give this school of thought some credibility. For instance, Thomas Malthus' message on the inevitability of overpopulation has been countered by the tapering of population growth in the industrialized nations, as well as by development of more productive crops. The acute wintertime coal smoke pollution problems of London were largely countered by shifts in fuels. Soil erosion on the Carolina Piedmont has decreased following shifts in the location of cotton production. Even though history may blunt pessimism, we think the something-will-come-along game is very chancely and costly. Not every environmental disaster has been averted. One need only look at some civilizations that have collapsed. Moreover, that something is not dropped like manna from heaven, it requires explicit design, policy decisions, market shifts, or behavioral changes. We do not find sin now and regret later discussions of interest. As mentioned, Jevons, 1866, pointed out that the then re rates of increase in English coal production, coal resources would soon be exhausted. He said, we have to make the choice between brief greatness and longer continued mediocrity. It didn't work out quite that way, of course. At any rate, there seems to be those who think that mediocrity is inevitable and hunkered down get used to lowered expectations as appropriate policy. Instead of commenting on today's debates and actions, this chapter takes the view that energy consumption is both the problem and the opportunity. It is the problem because it wastes many types of resources, and emissions tied to energy conversion. It is an opportunity because achieving reductions in energy use could well improve transportation services. There is more. Recognizing that energy use is one of an array of air, soil, water, nutrition, and other problems, Hollander makes the point that poverty is the real environmental problem, while affluence permits adjustments to problems in dealing with them. Transportation enters because it enables economic and social affluence in adjusting to changing circumstances. Transportation by creating wealth enables solutions to the problems it creates. Also, population increases, resource use changes, and adjustments in economic and social activities will ask for improvements in transportation's flexibility and efficiency. Postponing further treatment at this level of generality, we focus on the topical issue of greenhouse emissions, CO2 in particular, because of the tie between CO2 emissions and fossil fuel use. 27.3.2 Climate Change Concerned about climatic impacts of greenhouse gases, sometimes called global warming, the United Nations has held conferences and appointed study groups. Many nations have committed to a framework convention on climate change. Among other things, it calls for developing technologies, practices, and processes that control, reduce, or prevent anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases. Technology transfer is encouraged, especially to developing nations. For a variety of reasons, including doubts about whether global warming is actually underway, the role played by anthropogenic emissions, and the economic cost of reducing greenhouse gases, there is more talk than action. For transportation, the gas of main concern is CO2. As illustrated in Figure 27.9, CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing. While there are a number of greenhouse gases, we simplify our discussion by reasoning, transportation uses energy, which yields CO2, therefore we should examine reducing energy use in transportation. A 20 to 80 percent reduction in emissions is discussed. Can that be done in a reasonable way? Some argue for the need to adapt to prevent future damages. The question is another reason for our focus on energy and CO2. 27.3.3 Air Pollution Tetraethyl lead was added to petroleum in the 1920s to reduce knocking, improve octane ratings, increase both power and fuel economy. Unfortunately, the, le the lead, when combusted, would become an airborne pollutant, and when breathed in, would result in higher lead concentrations in the bloodstream. That was bad for health, and in children could limit development, lead to lower IQs, and engender more antisocial behavior. It was also damaging to the catalytic converter, which aimed at reducing other pollutants. Lead was not banned in the United States until the 1970s, Automakers and refiners were opponents. First, no new leaded gasoline cars were produced. Later, 1985, lead was no longer sold. The Soviet Union banned leaded fuels in cities in 1967. After the ban on leaded gasoline, IQs in the United States rose, consistent with and possibly explaining the Flynn effect, showing long-term increases in IQ, though the causality here is still a speculative hypothesis. It is easy to document that numerous counterproductive actions have been taken in the energy and environmental areas. 
More constructive public policy requires much better information than is available, an ability to set priorities and make trade-offs in a style that seeks satisfactory workable paths for improvements, as contrasted to the setting of standards that hold actors' feet to the fire. We ought to have better information. We ought to view achieving safety, cleaner air, and reduced energy consumption as some of the many ethical needs of society. But to say that it is not to say very much. The literature on the subject is not very helpful, for it curses the darkness rather than lights a candle. What are some lines of policy reasoning? One line of policy reasoning might go this way. We are heavily committed to policy and programs. There are associated heavy political and emotional commitments that cannot be changed easily. Therefore, for a period of time, we must let things go along as they are. When people become aware that things aren't going well, then more efficacious policies might be put in place. We are not happy with that line of reasoning, although we hear it often. Can we think of something better? Consider clean air. The air pollution emissions problem has been stated as a health imperative. The problem then becomes a how to achieve question and the broad issue is whether to use a command and control style or charge those who pollute. Presently, with a few exceptions, a command and control style is in use. Perhaps a cost-based line of policy reasoning and policy formation might be useful. Such policies have been developed and applied within some niches, market trading of emissions from certain large generators, for instance. It might be helpful if the policy debate would readdress the nature of the clean air imperative and how achieving it might conflict with other ethical needs or imperatives, such as making a living, social interaction, housing, and so on. While switching from command and control to a decentralized market-based approach may be reasonable, and at least should be considered, we are not optimistic about it in the short term. The notion of an imperative defines and gives such priority to policies that they are not open to discussion. Hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and ozone are associated with health problems, and automobiles are primary producers of CO. Automobiles appear to produce something like 60% of ozone precursors. From the violation of standards stance, ozone is the big problem. The U.S. federal standard for airsheds is given in Table 27.2, and these have been tightened over the years, both as the science and ability to measure has improved and understanding of health effects has changed, and as the ability to comply with the standards has improved. California has much more restrictive standards. For instance, the San Francisco-Oakland area with strong Pacific breezes is usually in compliance with federal standards, yet it violates state standards from time to time. Also, with respect to the vehicle fleet, old cars are the bad actors. A policy would be in order to scrap all pre-1975 or 1985 or 1995 or 2005 cars, often considered super emitters, and give their owners new cars. See also section 27.5.4. California is trying to phase in zero emission vehicles, electric vehicles or fuel cells, which have zero tailpipe emissions, but of course run on electricity generated somewhere. But the policy has met great resistance and has been stalled more than a decade. In part, the automakers complain about the inability to manufacture them, but are probably more concerned about poor consumer reception if the vehicles were not as good as, less powerful, shorter range, less reviable, conventional internal combustion engine powered vehicles, which have had a century to be perfected. This is discussed below in section 27.5.2. One of the strategies many cities have adopted to combat congestion and pollution is rationing of the use of automobile. Athens, Greece, for example, adopted odd-even rationing. You were permitted to drive based on the license plate number. Odd numbers could drive on odd days. The wealthy bought additional vehicles to skirt the regulation. The less wealthy might buy it second license plates. Twenty seven point four The Automobile Vilified twenty seven point four point one Attacks on Sin. In the early days in the United States, the automobile was regarded as a rich man's toy, just as today when Humvees or Priuses are viewed as status signifiers. Views of the automobile as a luxury have affected policy. In Europe, this resulted in steeply graduated levy on engine displacement. Only the rich had large cars. Early in 1989, Daniel E. Koshlin, Jr., professor of biochemistry at Berkeley, proposed a tax on large engines. A tax on sin, the six-cylinder. A tax on sin, where sin is defined on the basis of national policy rather than personal peccadillo. Economist George Stigler replied, Daniel Koshland, editorial 20th January, page 281, proposes a proportional progressive tax on automobiles on the basis of their fuel consumption. The benefits he lists are numerous, smaller deficits in the federal budget and foreign aid, cleaner air, and better care of the needy. This last a fine example of d double counting. The same argument calls for progressive taxation of dwelling units. They too use fuel, and to paraphrase Koshland on automobiles, most rooms in larger homes have less than one occupant. He appropriately remarks that if this kind of policy becomes widely accepted, it could be extended to other areas, room temperatures, illumination, travel. Koshland's editorial presents by example his distinction between national policy and personal peccadillo. Could he have confused the two? 
We have no sharp understanding of why autos and auto travel have long been regarded as conspicuous consumption more so than other goods or services. We suspect that it has something to do with breaking up of old arrangements and the creation of new ones. 27.4.2. The Automobile as Drug. Let's consider the automobile and environment. Newman and Kenworthy 1989 popularized the term automobile dependence, analogous to drug dependence. By neat association of the automobile with the evils of drugs, the auto too, because of its environmental and social effects, becomes evil in their nominally scientific public health-oriented worldview. As distasteful as it may seem, it seems that the drug problem and the environmental problem have much in common. Each move from complexity to simplicity. Each is treated in the moral imperative style of policymaking. If the automobile is evil transportation, its alternatives must be good. The enemy of thine enemy is thy friend. Twenty-seven point five responses. The ills described in this chapter: too much energy consumption, energy market instability, too much emissions, are all addressed by improved fuel efficiency. It is a vehicle matter, but change in the fuel for automobiles is constrained by other components of the system fuel supply. This sharply limits what can be done. Disjoint decision making, lack of incentives, and rules fashioned decades ago help prevent this from happening. For instance, the corporate average fuel economy standards, which have turned out to be relatively successful, developed after the fuel shortfalls of the 1970s, were applied to cars. Yet more than half of all U.S. cars are now trucks, pickups, sport utility vehicles. To move a person one kilometers requires that we move along a ton or more of tear weight, the auto, and the movement of one ton of freight also requires, at best, that we move a ton of equipment. That is resource demanding. It constrains what we can expect to achieve from energy conservation efforts. It makes the services more expensive than they need to be. Just the room it takes to move tear weight is demanding of facility investment. The system is locked in by design decisions made in earlier days. Modern vehicle equipment is descended from beefed-up wagons and buggies. It is the result of incremental change. No other kinds of change can be easily made. The reduction in the weight of automobiles has had safety and ride quality costs and has hardly reduced the costs of vehicles. This section examines several strategies to reduce automobile fuel consumption, very small cars, electric vehicles, and scrappage schemes. 27.5.1 Very Small Cars Consider the collection of problems involving pollution, energy use, and access to the auto system. They flow from predominant design characteristics. As a result of those characteristics, there is a lot of mass in vehicles. So let's intervene in the system to reduce mass. With current technology, a passenger vehicle can be built for about one half the cost of a compact car. It would weigh about 225 kilograms, achieve 80 kilometers per liter, and have high performance, say 0 to 95 kilometers per hour, in six seconds. Amory and Hunter Lovins at the Snow Mass Institute have developed a concept for standard volume, but low mass hypercar that, by using advanced materials, Combustion devices and energy storage achieves 38 kilometers per liter. They believe this automobile can be made available at a price acceptable to the market by early in the 21st century, and over the long term, efficiency can be doubled. While the product technology information put forth sounds reasonable, there is an enormous assumption that somehow production for mass markets will greatly decrease production costs. But perhaps the problem is scoping. Do we need high performance from a vehicle most of the time? Most travels local, and on short trips, we don't need powerful acceleration or to carry around the equipment needed for such power. Very small, low-speed vehicles have less performance than regular cars, but come with much less cost. The general idea of specialized vehicles, roads, and operations is beginning to find markets. Disney considered it for the Celebration Newtown in Florida, and others at the Research Triangle Institute in North Carolina have as well. For example, golf carts are widely used in southern U.S. retirement communities as off-road transportation, but they are also used on low-speed streets. And some golf carts begin to resemble neighborhood vehicles. Laws need to be revised and networks developed to encourage them. A match exists between the idea and planning notions of new urbanist villages. So why hasn't the markets pulled small vehicle development and sales except in small market niches? We suppose the current protocols for facility design are a limiting factor. Several vehicle manufacturers have inquired, and the idea has been introduced to the Society of Automotive Engineers (SAE) community. We sense that the sticky question in deployment is changing road designs, and have been given such design attention. See Figure 27.10. With small amounts of energy use, energy and pollution problems are sharply reduced. The small cross section suggests more efficient road use and parking, yielding major changes in congestion problems. The high performance version could be used for commuting with salutary effects on accessibility to jobs and residential sites. The low performance version might be used for neighborhood travel. Low cost and simple to operate, it would ease access to the system. Problems for the poor and the elderly. It reduces insult to residential areas. 27.5.2, EV Redux. 
It doesn't notice when you turn down your thermostat and drive a hybrid car. These actions simply spread the pain over a few centuries, the bat of an eyelash as far as the earth is concerned, and leave the end result exactly the same. All the fossil fuel that used to be in the ground is now in the air, and none is left to burn. Robert McLaughlin, The Earth Doesn't Care If You Drive a Hybrid, an American Scholar. While popular at the beginning of the 20th century, see section 7.2, interest in electric vehicles waned for the decades of the 1920s until the 1970s. The energy crisis of the early 1970s revived attention. In 1976, the Electric and Hybrid Vehicle Research Development and Demonstration Act provided modest support. The electric utility industry, through the Electric Power Research Institute, also began support, seeing that EVs could become important for their public utility members. By the 1990s, the market was getting more ready, with both energy and environmental concerns used as rationales. California implemented, but later deferred, policies requiring zero-emission vehicles on the road. GM's impact, designed by Paul McCready, entered the market with high hopes. Later dubbed the EV1, it plied the roads of California for a few years before being killed by General Motors, as documented in the film, Who Killed the Electric Car?, which considered oil companies, GM, politicians, and consumers as among the suspects. The main problem that challenged EVs in the first decade of the 20th century, range, had not really been solved by the last decade of that century. GM re-entered the EV market in 2011 with a Chevy Volt, while Nissan entered with a Leaf and Honda with a Fit. It's probably worth noting that GM and Chrysler, two of the three largest remaining U.S. automakers, were briefly nationalized following the economic shock of 2008. Ford remained private. Federal policies on emission and fuel efficiency were ratcheted up in this period. New companies were formed to market high-end EVs. Tesla Motors, founded by entrepreneur Elon Musk, who also founded SpaceX and PayPal, sold about 2,650 Model S cars in 2012, about the same number it sold in the first two months of 2013, following on their more expensive Tesla Roadster. Sales of other EVs were also in the low thousands. Estimated EV sales were about 0.2% of the market share in 2012, while the U.S. market was at about 13 to 14 million cars and light trucks per year. That has not stopped Musk and others from predicting that EVs will be the dominant vehicle in the future. Musk has claimed most new cars will be EVs within 20 years. To give a sense of the state of the technology, the Honda Fit had an energy efficiency of 29 kilowatt hours per 100 miles, 18 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, lower is better, combined city and highway, which the EPA scores at 118 miles per gallon equivalent, 50 kilometers per liter, higher is better, with an 82 mile or 132 kilometer range. As of 2012, the U.S. government provides what might be characterized as an infant industry subsidy of $2,500 in tax credits for plug-in EVs, and has in the past provided other subsidies for fuel-efficient vehicles. Many states and other countries provide additional subsidies. In the early 2000s, hybrid electric vehicles started to become popular. See figures 2712 and 2713. These vehicles had both an internal combustion engine and were electric-powered, overcoming the range concerns as the electricity would be used on city streets and the internal combustion engine could recharge the battery. The main market remained gasoline-powered vehicles, which became much more efficient over time. Unfortunately for the environment, that efficiency was used up by producing vehicles with greater horsepower, rather than vehicles with better fuel economy. Fuel economy at 1985 levels of vehicle performance would be up to 30% better. In the United States, electric vehicles are a social status symbol, a way to wear your concern for the environment as a badge. Owners of EVs once painted the word electric on their cars. With HEVs, The design of the vehicle itself was a slightly more subtle signifier, known to all who matter, that the individual cared more about the environment than you did, for example, a Toyota Prius or a Honda Insight. As social markers, hybrids also became fodder for the culture wars, as noted in the section's opening quote. Other electric vehicles, two-wheelers in the developing world, especially in China, have been enormously successful from a market perspective. These provide an upgrade path between the inexpensive but speed-limited bicycle and the much more expensive and rationed automobile. Onboard batteries are only one possible technology for supplying electric cars with energy. Others include ultracapacitors, fuel cells, which directly transform chemical fuels into electricity with oxygen, or another oxidizing agent for onboard generation, or cables or wireless electric transmission from the network to the vehicle. In the late 1990s, there was a lot of excitement about the prospects of hydrogen fuel cells, but while costs have been driven down, they have yet to be cost-effective comparable with batteries, much less internal combustion engines, And the most optimistic thing you can say is the time frame of the promoters has been stretched. 27.5.3. Implications of EVs on financing. If EVs or other non-petroleum-based energy sources become widely adopted, the primary source funding U.S. highways since its 1919 debut, the gas tax, will come to an end. The United States, in contrast with many other countries, hypothecates motor fuel taxes to pay for transportation. 
Imagine all gasoline vehicle users pay for all transportation costs. Imagine total expenses are $100 million and the total number of users are 1 million, and all gasoline powers get 30 miles per gallon. In that case, if all vehicles are gasoline powered, the gas tax will be, 30, will be 30 cents per gallon in line with current costs. Now imagine only half of all cars pay the gas tax. The tax jumps to 60 cents to cover costs, still quite tolerable, but as the gas tax rises, the number of gasoline powered cars should be expected to fall. Figure 27.14 shows the expected gas tax based on the assumptions with a very number of gasoline-powered cars on the road. Note especially that this is a log-log scale. At 50,000 cars with gasoline engines, 95% non-gasoline-powered, the tax jumps to $6 per gallon, European levels. But the last car has to pay $300,000 per gallon. The move away from the gas tax is a positive feedback system that will accelerate. A replacement will be required. We have discussed elsewhere some possibilities with direct road pricing the most likely. To be clear, there is no obvious reason to move from the gas tax before it is necessary. The tax is administratively very efficient and accomplish the basic policy ends of raising funds from drivers roughly in proportion to use while discouraging gasoline consumption. But it will at some point become necessary if alternative fuels are adopted. 27.5.4 Scrappage Schemes the UK scrappage scheme and the US cash for clunkers were policies adopted during the Great Recession of 2008 to 2009 to help stimulate auto sales while improving average air quality by getting super emitters off the road. The policy gave car purchasers money towards the purchase of a new car when they turned in an older car with worse fuel economy. It has been estimated that the worst 10% of vehicles are responsible for 60% of emissions. This is similar to the Pareto Principle or 80 20 rule, which says that 80% of effort results from 20% of the causes. So if those cars could be removed from the road, air quality would improve greatly. The plans give cash incentives to people trading in old cars for new cars. The new car had better fuel economy. The idea was first proposed in the UK, and as we have mentioned before, ideas are light baggage. It quickly traveled across the pond to the United States, where it was implemented. The assessments of the programs are at, at best mixed. The US cash for clunkers programs did induce new vehicle purchase in July and August of 2009, as intended but these purchases were offset by fewer purchases in later months. Fuel economy did increase, as the program required, but by less than one mile per gallon. The cost-effectiveness of the program from an environmental perspective has been challenged, estimated to cost $92 to $450 per ton of CO2 avoided, at best five times market value. 27.6 Discussion Safety, congestion, energy, and environmental problems have been long with us in transportation, but environmental costs are garnering a larger share of attention. An array of varied activities exist, some of which are leading to results already or being implemented. For example, more efficient diesel engines, better truck aerodynamics, more energy-efficient aircraft. Some of the activities are intended to ready technologies for use in the future, for example, improved batteries, inertial energy storage devices, use of lighter weight materials in vehicles, and fuel cells. An optimistic scenario says that over a period of decades, we can move into a future that has the properties of the polished present. We say that is optimistic because higher energy costs make otherwise relatively expensive technologies feasible. If these alternative low-mass, low-energy vehicles can be implemented across modes, the energy for moving things around problem, as well as the air pollution and CO2 problems, will have been at least partially countered. But there remain other issues that beg improvements in transportation, for example, congestion avoiding decreases in productivity, and enabling settlement and social and economic adjustments responding to population growth and migration, and pressures from disparities in economic and social progress, as well as shifts steered by changes in resource conditions and new activities.